Uh, we would like to acknowledge the support uh, for this podcast that has been provided by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Merck and Company Incorporated. Hi, this is Vic Mitty, Chair of the AUA Office of Education, and I'd like to welcome you to another AUA Office of Education podcast. This one in a series of breaking down the barriers, incorporating new immuno-oncologic therapies. This particular podcast is going to focus on biomarkers. Um, first, I'd like to give uh, a brief uh, introduction of the learning objectives, and then I'm going to introduce uh, my co-host, Dr. Matthew Malowski. Now, the learning objectives for this podcast are to identify current immuno-oncologic treatment barriers associated with biomarkers, understand the current landscape of biomarkers for IO therapy and urothelial cancer, identify current limitations and barriers to the use of biomarkers in urothelial cancer, and finally, to describe the ongoing efforts to develop novel biomarkers for IO therapy, for IO therapy in urothelial cancer. Now it is my great uh, pleasure to introduce my co-host, Dr. Matthew Malowski. Dr. Malowski is professor of medicine at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine and the section of genitourinary and the section of genitourinary oncology in the division of hematology oncology, as well as the co-director of the urologic oncology program at the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Care Center. He is a medical oncologist with a clinical and translational research interest in urothelial cancer. And he has a particular interest in the design of clinical trials that utilize novel immunotherapies, as well as those that use an integrated genomics approach to characterize urothelial cancers for genetic alterations that may represent targets for novel agents. He also co-chairs the ASCO Genital Urinary Cancer Guideline Advisory Group, and is a co-chair on the NCI Bladder Cancer Task Force. Uh, Matt, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. So I guess uh, we can start with a brief overview of the current landscape of immuno-oncologic therapy in patients with advanced urothelial carcinoma. Yeah, absolutely. Um, good place to start. Uh, at first, I'll briefly review uh, the current FDA approvals for IO therapy in patients who have progressed after first-line therapy for metastatic disease. And so currently, there are five immune checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, nivolumab, dervalumab, and avalumab. And these are FDA approved for patients who have progressed after first-line therapy. The response rates for these agents range between 15 to 23 percent in the second line setting, and pembrolizumab is the only therapy that has demonstrated a survival benefit in the Keynote 45 study that randomized patients to pembrolizumab versus standard chemotherapy, and the median overall survival for pembrolizumab was 10.3 months versus 7.4 months. All of the other agents were approved based on favorable response rates with associated durability as compared to historical controls. The um, other approvals represent those for patients with metastatic urothelial cancer in the first line setting. And so here we have two agents that are approved, pembrolizumab and atezolizumab. And these are approved again in the setting of patients who are ineligible to receive cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Based on the results of two studies, the Keynote 52 trial with pembrolizumab and the Invigor 210 Cohort 1 uh, trial, both of which are phase two studies. And the response rates here were 27 and 23 percent with promising survival outcomes as compared to historical controls that ultimately led to their approvals. A bit later, uh, we'll uh, touch on some of the FDA uh, news uh, related to uh, a revised indication for the use of these uh, two agents in the first-line setting. And so needless to say, it's been an extremely exciting time for uh, 
drug development in urothelial carcinoma, specifically with regard to immuno-oncology agents. So, Matt, what do you see as uh, the major limitations of uh, IO therapy uh, in patients with metastatic disease? And we can first discuss uh, efficacy and then uh, move into um, side effects and toxicity. Sure. So I think, you know, the obvious is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, as much as this is a huge splash in the field, uh, only 15 to 30 percent of patients uh, respond to iotherapy. And so the majority of patients with advanced disease are, are non-responders. And so if we treat all patients, we expose them to potentially ineffective treatment, uh, the toxicities that go along with these agents, and the obvious substantial uh, core costs associated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. With regard to toxicity, I'm sorry, with regard to toxicity. You go. Yeah, with regard to toxicity, as you uh, asked, you know, these agents are very well tolerated. Uh, the side effect profiles, you have some fatigue, some pruritus, nausea, diarrhea, but less commonly, you get these immune-related adverse events, and these are essentially autoimmune phenomena, such as pneumonitis, colitis, nephritis, and others, and they can be quite serious and generally require uh, stopping the agent uh, and the use of, at times, high-dose uh, steroids with, uh, with prolonged tapers. Uh, and so uh, these are not in uh, consequential uh, potential side effects. And so obviously we'd ideally like them to be able to be delivered to the patients who, who are most likely to benefit. So that really brings us into uh, really the next, uh, the, my next question and really the, the, the topic of this podcast. And that is, do we have any biomarkers or anything that helps us to predict either response or predict toxicity to any of these agents? Yeah, so that's sort of the holy grail here. Um, the answer is that there are a number of biomarkers that are currently in development, and some which are being used, but they're, they're less than ideal. Uh, the one that uh, is most known is PDL1 expression uh, as a biomarker for iotherapy. And so PDL1 uh, expression is seen in about 20 to 30 percent of urothelial cancer specimens. And there's been a lot of variability among clinical trials that have incorporated PDL1 staining uh, in urothelial cancer. For example, there was no association with response seen in the Invigor 210 cohort 2 study of atezolizumab in the second line setting, in the Keynote 45 study with pembrolizumab, in the Checkmate 275 study with the drug nivolumab. However, there was a strong association seen using a composite biomarker uh, in the phase 1-2 Dervalumab study, leading to its approval along with a companion assay in May of 2017. So a little bit of back and forth here about the utility of PD-L1 uh, with uh, a number of agents that really uh, seem to work quite similarly. Do you think that as with, with current biomarkers or um, potentially future biomarkers that there will be different different or, or different predictors to different IO therapies or do you think that um, sort of one size fits all um, with a checkpoint inhibitor in other words is there will there be a biomarker that predicts a response to checkpoint inhibitors, or do you think it will be broken down to much more, you know, based on the individual checkpoint inhibitors? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I think with the current landscape in terms of looking at the efficacy data with regard to these uh, agents, um, my sense is that uh, we should be able to at least find a biomarker with regard to the agents that are currently uh, approved that would work for the majority of them based on the mechanism of action of these agents and the similarity with regard to responses. Uh, and so I think that as we develop, obviously, new immuno-oncology agents, then that very well may change. So now you mentioned uh, PDL one um, Do you think this holds promise in the future, or do you think we need to look for other biomarkers? Yeah, PDL1 is a tough one. Uh, there's a lot of interassay variability um, for the FDA-approved agents. Four assays were used for PDL1. 
uh, different clones for the immunohistochemistry. Uh, the scoring compartments are different. For example, the pembrolizumab and the bilumab studies used tumor cell, and the atezolizumab used immune cell. The thresholds for positivity differ in the assays. Um, we're all familiar with the concept of intratumoral heterogeneity that could potentially lead to differences in pd one expression. And pd one is also felt to be a dynamic uh, biomarker. And so it actually may change over time. And so what pd one positivity means one day uh, may be very different the next. And so uh, it's a complicated biomarker to use uh, for many reasons. Are there any other biomarkers or um, any other potential biomarkers that you see out there that are uh, currently being used or we might see in use in the immediate future? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, um, you know, pd one is, is one that we're using. And, you know, I had mentioned earlier this business with the first line uh, therapies uh, in cisplatin uh, ineligible patients. And, here, uh, there was an inferior survival uh, signal seen in a pre-planned interim analysis of two phase three trials, the Keno 361 and Invigor 130 studies that compared chemotherapy with either pembrolizumab or atezolizumab, respectively, uh, to chemotherapy as well as monotherapy with a checkpoint inhibitor to chemotherapy. And essentially what they saw was an inferior survival signal seen in the immune checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy arm as compared to chemotherapy alone in patients with low pd one expression by the respective assays. And so the FDA uh, released an alert and changed the label such that we now are required to do pdl one testing for patients with locally advanced or metastatic urothelial cancer who are ineligible for cisplatin-containing chemotherapy, um, such that an indication is now only for those who test positive by pdl one expression by immunistic chemistry. So I don't want to toss pdl one away completely. Um, but uh, again, clearly it is not ideal, but it is uh, actively being used. Um, with regard to your question, there's many biomarkers that are currently being developed that uh, are, are quite exciting. There's data uh, with regard to RNA subtyping uh, as a potential biomarker for iotherapy. Uh, and several groups have identified uh, what are referred to as intrinsic subtypes of muscle invasive bladder cancer that have similarity to the intrinsic subtypes of breast cancer. And so these, are the, these are the basal and luminal subtypes, uh, predominantly are the major subtypes. Uh, depending upon whether you're a lumper or a splitter, there can be more or less. Uh, but these subtypes are characterized by different histopathologic features, different mutations, such as the presence of FGFR3 mutations in luminal tumors, and, and also potential responsiveness uh, to different uh, therapies. And so that's one RNA subtyping that you know, there is uh, data that's been generated suggesting, as an example, in the Invigor 210 study with the tezolizumab, when they used the TCGA for the subtyping, there was a higher response rate in the luminal cluster 2 subtype. Uh, and uh, in another study, in the phase 2 Checkmate 275 study with nebulumab, it was the basal 1 subtype. And so, you know, you could see here that in spite of using these therapies and what look like similar patient populations using the RNA subtyping data, you get different uh, differences depending upon the study when you look at them. And it may be related to the tissues that are analyzed as one possibility, as well as variability in the assays, as well as others. You know, Matt, do, do, does any of this subtyping, you know, we're talking about IO therapy, but is, is any of this subtype, subtyping uh, useful in predicting a response to chemotherapy, for example? Yeah, it's, it's, it's another great question. The, the answer is yes. I mean, it looks as though this subtyping could potentially be helpful not only for iotherapy, but for example, uh, one group uh, led by Dr. McConkey uh, at Hopkins has shown that the P53-like tumors uh, may not respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and may be better suited for targeted therapies, even things like FGFR3 inhibitors. So, uh, so yeah, these are sort of uh, potential biomarkers, not only for response to immuno-oncology agents, but also to, to chemotherapy and potentially even targeted therapies uh, as we incorporate more of those uh, into the treatment of patients with urothelial cancer. So what, what do you see as the future of uh, RNA subtyping? You know, I think subtypes are promising, uh, but clearly uh, we need better standardization and there is an international working group 
uh, more work is clearly needed and subtypes may need to be combined with other biomarkers, I think, to ultimately have robust enough predictive value to, to be utilized. Okay, now any other potential biomarkers for iotherapy? Yeah, so I think that the big one uh, is uh, tumor mutational burden or neoantigen burden. Uh, and um, mutational load and the number of predicted neoantigens has been associated with an improved outcomes to a new immune checkpoint blockade in a number of cancers, most notably in melanoma and in non-small cell lung cancer. And what we know is that urothelial cancer actually has one of the highest mutational burdens along with melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer. And so it represents an ideal cancer to be able to evaluate the predictive role for mutation burden. The other thing we know is that defects in DNA repair genes have been associated with a 40% response rate to pembrolizumab, one of the PD-1 uh, agents in, uh, in MSI high and uh, mismatch repair division cancers, leading to its FDA approval agnostic to tumor type. And so this is an extremely exciting development and speaks to the potential for cross-tumor predictive biomarkers. Uh, and so, you know, mutational burden is, is, is a very interesting one. And there's already been data generated um, from clinical trials. Um, the Invigor 210 study with the tezolizumab demonstrated a correlation between uh, improved survival and the highest quartile of tumor mutational burden. And then in another study, a phase three study of a tezolizumab, Again, TMB was associated with improved survival with a tezolizumab, but not with chemotherapy. Um, so, you know, I think this is pointing in a very positive direction for the potential predictive value of TMB. You know, the, the, my next question may be one of ignorance on my part, but do you think that uh, if you look at the three current biomarkers that, that have been used, PDL1, RNA subtyping, uh, mutational burden, uh, neoantigen burden. Is is there any way to combine these three, or are they so different that you wouldn't look at combinations of PDL1 and RNA subtyping, or et cetera? Or might we in the future break it down and, and look at each of these um, potentially in combination or all three in combination as predictors? So I think it is, it's not an ignorant question at all. It's exactly what's happening. Um, people are recognizing the limitations with regard to the predictive value of individual biomarkers and are looking to develop ways to combine these biomarkers to be able to predict response. And so there have been efforts looking uh, at these in combination, uh, TMB, looking at DNA damage repair gene alterations um, uh, and others to be able to understand what combination of biorhythm, biomarkers or what type of algorithm we can use to incorporate uh, these biomarkers to be able to uh, predict for response or for that matter, for resistance to therapy, right? Which is equally as important so as not to deliver ineffective therapies to patients with the potential for, for, for toxicities as we talked about. So now what's out there on the horizon? What are some of the potential biomarkers that are being investigated now? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, you know, still PDL one active investigation, RNA expression subtyping, tumor mutational burden, all of these are actively under investigation. One of the issues is that much of the work has been a more retrospective type of approach to evaluating these biomarkers. And uh, for uh, biomarker uh, development, uh, we need to uh, look at the prospective biomarker development as well. Um, immune gene expression profiling is uh, also uh, another uh, exciting uh, avenue. Uh, this is a more comprehensive way of understanding the immune microenvironment, and so you can determine hot versus cold tumors. And so, for example, tumors with an inflamed tumor microenvironment may lend itself to improved responses to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And in one study, the Checkmate 275 study of nivolumab, they used a 25-gene interferon gamma signature that was associated with improved responses to nivolumab. And you know, immunohistochemistry has even been used to bucket tumors into immune desert, immune excluded and inflamed phenotypes to predict the responsiveness 
to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, you know, immune gene expression profiling is a way of looking again at the immune uh, microenvironment to be able to uh, predict um, a response. Uh, another one is TCR clonality, and so uh, this has been looked at in several studies. Uh, one example is patients treated with a tezlizumab had high T cell infiltration and clonality in the tumors, uh, and this was associated with a response to treatment. Uh, and um, there's also specific genetic alterations uh, that potentially predict response. And so it's a very nice work that was published looking at, this was in kidney cancer, but loss of function mutations in PBRM1 gene, which encodes a subunit of the PBAF sui sniff chromatin remodeling complex. And this is associated with responsiveness to immune checkpoint blockade by altering tumor cell expression profiling. Uh, and in addition, FDFR3 mutations, which all of us are familiar with, more commonly seen in, in patients with non-invasive disease, but also seen, you know, in upwards of 20% of patients, 15 to 20% of patients with muscle invasive metastatic disease, are associated with an immune desert phenotype. And so that may predict, as an example, hypothetically, a lack of responsiveness to immune checkpoint blockade. So uh, a lot of activity. Uh, and again, I think you know, things like tumor mutational burden are looking at the tumor, but one of the issues with tumor mutational burden, as an example, is that it actually doesn't or excludes the evaluation of the tumor immune microenvironment. And going back to your question about, you know, combining these things, I think that's a perfect example of how do we look at the tumor and how do we look at the tumor immune microenvironment to be able to come up with a biomarker uh, that is able to predict responsiveness because I think clearly uh, both of those are going to be extremely important. You know, Matt, as as IO therapy is potentially expanding into the treatment of um, non-metastatic uh, urothelial cancer and even non-muscle invasive urothelial cancer, is there the same enthusiasm for biomarkers, uh, or maybe more enthusiasm for biomarkers? Uh, in treating the disease at an earlier stage? Yeah, I think, um, great question. I mean, I think it is now more critical than ever to look at biomarkers um, and develop those uh, for this very reason. I mean, I think we've all been excited with the developments of metastatic disease, but I think based on some recent data, uh, for example, in muscle invasive bladder cancer, there were two presentations, uh, two studies, Abacus and and Pure Zero One, which were preliminary studies of neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitors in the muscle invasive setting, uh, demonstrating very promising pathologic response rates. And so, um, you know, one of the questions there is uh, if we have a biomarker that we can use to potentially predict responsiveness to iotherapy in that way, then can we potentially embark on a bladder preservation approach uh, with patients who are the ones who are most likely to develop those complete pathologic responses? And so, more than ever, uh, is it important to develop biomarkers as we apply these therapies uh, to a wider uh, net of, uh, of patients with, with bladder cancer, uh, with a very exciting work in, as you suggest, non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive disease? You know, Matt, I'm going to throw out a question that's related to IO therapy, but uh, not necessarily biomarkers, but it just came to, to mind as we start to treat um, local disease muscle invasive or or non-muscle invasive with IO therapy, what's the end point of the therapy? Does the therapy continue indefinitely or if the patient is free of disease for a period of time? And, and I don't know, maybe we don't know the answer to this yet, but will there be a time when that therapy can be stopped? Right. So, um, you know, uh, we don't know the answer is the answer. Um, but I think, obviously, with the potential toxicities uh, as well as uh, the substantial costs, this is another critically important question. In terms of muscle invasive disease, um, you know, fortunately, in the neoadjuvant setting, which is a nice place uh, to look, you give a defined number of cycles of therapy. And in the two studies that have been done, they've actually used as little as two to three cycles of therapy and demonstrated those pathologic response rates. What's the right number of cycles? I think we clearly don't know. Um, there are uh, adjuvant uh, therapy studies. There are three adjuvant therapy studies um, that are um, looking at IO therapy uh, for a defined uh, period of time. 
uh, up to a year. And, uh, you know, that might be interesting because that might give us some understanding of what that timeline looks like. Um, I think your question is very uh, critical to the whole issue of non-muscle invasive disease when you're looking at, you know, you know progression and, and recurrence and not really understanding. But there are studies that are being designed now to actually look at this question uh, of duration. And there has been an indication in other diseases, such as melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer, that you don't necessarily need to treat forever, um, which is good news uh, for, uh, most importantly, patients. Um, and uh, also, uh, again, speaks to the, you know, the issue related to cost um, for these uh, extraordinarily expensive therapies. Well, it's certainly clear that uh, IO therapy is, um, it's exciting uh, as we look to, to treat our patients with uh, metastatic urothelial cancer and even uh, non-metastatic urothelial cancer uh, in better ways. And this is something that you're obviously uh, very passionate about. Um, it, it seems like we've made progress, but there's certainly uh, uh, more work to be done and more progress to be made. And I, I thought maybe we could take the last uh, minute or two and just have you um, summarize where IO therapy is today uh, and where you see it going in the future and, and, and your hopes for its uh, expansion um, uh, into our armamentarium. Yeah, no. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this has been an extraordinary time. I mean, for those of us in medical oncology that treat patients with metastatic disease after three decades of very little progress and uh, the ability to use chemotherapy with limited response rates, I mean, iotherapy has really transformed the field. Uh, this is, I think, an extremely important discussion, perhaps the most important discussion related to predictive biomarkers for response, because we really desperately need to be able to select patients who are likely to benefit from these therapies. You know, we've got the potential for ineffective treatment, toxicity, substantial cost, and we all have to work tirelessly to get this job done. Um, there's a lot of excitement with non-muscle invasive disease. Um, I talked about the data with muscle invasive disease. Um, there is preliminary data using combination approaches of immune checkpoint inhibitors with other IO therapies, as well as immuno-oncology agents in combination with targeted therapies, and most recently with chemotherapy. And this may be and is likely to be, frankly, uh, the, the, the future in terms of the development with combination strategies. And we may need to embark on additional biomarker studies to understand this, uh, but we really need to act quickly to develop biomarkers as we apply these, as you suggested, to more and more patients. Uh, and again, these combination IO approaches may need to take us even in different directions uh, with regard to uh, how we further uh, biomarker development. Uh, so, yeah, no, this is uh, an extraordinary time for patients with, uh, with, with bladder cancer. Well, uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Matthew Malowski, Professor of Medicine at University of North Carolina School of Medicine and uh, Section Chief of uh, uh, GU Oncology in the Division of Hematology and Oncology. Um, thank you so much for that uh, uh, really uh, terrific overview of uh, IO therapies, uh, the uh, advances we've made and uh, and where we hope to go in the future. I'd also like to uh, thank the audience for listening. Uh, and uh, as always, if you need more information, please uh, visit us at uh, auau.aua. Please visit us at auau.auanet.org. Uh,